This is Mona Lisa Baseball, and here we are, March 2024. What a journey. Yeah, let's go back to the beginning for a moment. March 2021, Season 1, Episode 1 was recorded. Really the only major change to the game from the 100 or so years before it was extra inning, plant a runner on second base for the 10th inning. We'll take the 2020 season and kind of chuck it out the window because it was shortened. They decided to go designated hitter in both leagues. Dodgers won the World Series, but it didn't quite feel right. Once the game decided it was going to scrap pitchers hitting in the National League, that for me was the moment that I had to bear down and do what I could to save the sport or it would kill me mentally. Couldn't just sit on my hands. So if you think back, bases were the regular size. They reinstated pitchers hitting in the National League. If you wanted to pick a runner off, you could throw as many times as you wanted. And for Christ's sakes, there definitely was no goddamn clock dictating how the sport was played. So that's March 2021. I laid out a lot of warnings, and here we are, March 2024. 2023 was reportedly the lowest viewed World Series since they've had those statistics, certainly percentage-wise of the population. However, at the beginning of last year, Rob Manfred went on some sort of morning show And they did announce that the game had record profits and patted him squarely on the back for that. So here we are in March 2024. How do you feel about the sport right now? I was tempted to say least anticipated baseball season in baseball history. I believe that's true for me. Might not be true for you. But are you feeling good about the way things are going right now in the sport? Are you excited in the next year or two? to no longer have umpires in the game. How do you feel about the idea that you could be watching a very, very important World Series game and have a clock get in the way of the action that's happening on the field? Does that feel okay? No, it doesn't to me. It doesn't feel okay in any way. So as far as the offseason goes... I got myself an old truck, and that old truck came with a radio. I looked for my favorite stations. I didn't come up with much. I basically found NPR was put on by the local broadcast on FM, and on AM, I found Fox Sports Radio. Now, ironically, this is the same Fox Sports that has Chris Broussard on it, and he was partly responsible for the beginnings of this show only because I heard him ask the question, why can't baseball change? And he basically was proved right that it can change and it will change. It's up to you to decide if the game's better for it or not. When I drive myself to work in the mornings, oftentimes I will tune in and the first voice that I hear is Dan Patrick. He does the morning show. Then it moves on to Colin Cowherd, whom... I wouldn't say I was a fan, but I think he has a good show. It moves on from there, Cavino and Rich, Doug Gottlieb, into The Odd Couple, and I haven't heard any other shows yet. Now, I was an avid sports talk listener growing up, and I'd say I've had a pretty solid, oh, 20 to 30 year gap where I've been getting very, very little sports talk radio in my life. Uh, And it's been fun rejoining with it. The first thing that just sticks out to me about this state of baseball, the state of sports, is uh, basically every single show is sponsored by DraftKings or some other type of gambling website. So what that tells me is gambling is going to play a very large role in up-and-coming sports. So where are sports headed because of the gambling implications? And I think you're going to want to be careful when rooting for money or for your own profits exceeds your desire for your own team to win. 
it certainly will make you question why you are a sports fan. Now, uh, for the record, I have nothing against sports gambling. I certainly think it can be fun or gambling in general. But when you're going to kind of place the hopes of a sport squarely on gambling, I think you got a big issue because pretty much most people can agree that when money takes over things, uh, it has a very good chance of ruining them. I would say the most glaring example for that very quickly at a cursory glance would be going to Wrigley Field for the first time last year and seeing that they shaved a nice square, perhaps it was a rectangle, out of the ivy wall so that there could be an advertisement for DraftKings within the ivy, the sacred ivy of Wrigley Field. Uh, I had a problem with that. We asked my cousin, who was big time into fantasy football at the time, if he would rather have his fantasy team perform well or his favorite football team win. And it took him about five seconds, and he said, fantasy. So when you start moving away from being a fan of a team, just for the sport of it, for the natural sort of kid-like appeal of wanting your team to win. When I was a kid, I just wanted the Giants to win. I wanted to see them in the playoffs, and I wanted to see them in the World Series. What is more pure than a childlike enthusiasm for something? It's kind of the best case scenario. I instantly think of the 88 World Series when the Dodgers won the game after Kurt Gibson's homer, and Dodger Stadium is literally rocking back and forth with enthusiasm. What percentage of the people in those stands just won money? What percentage of the people in the stands were thrilled that the Dodgers won? You don't want to tip those scales too far to the gambling side, or you're going to lose something very pure and very important. And I think it's the thing that first got you into sports. So baseball has been moving right along in the last three years. And what we've provided for you at Mona Lisa Baseball is a real-time experience of how the game has changed. The reason I think that is so important is baseball, we'll just say, began somewhere in the mid-1800s, probably before that. How long have people been whacking objects with sticks? Very long time. But for the sake of ease, we'll just say, yay, 175 years. And yes, it's changed it around a lot. Basically, we'll say in the last 100 years, really found its form. And yes, some minor tweaks to the game as far as the rules go has happened. But the game was basically played the same way. And once you understood the rules, you didn't have to question them. You knew the way that the game went. Now, certain players have come along that have changed the entire way the sport is played. A couple guys that I started to think about that really did that were Ichiro and Shohei. Those are two recent examples. You could go back to Nomo, and probably sinker balls got more popular after Nomo had a spectacular rookie year. But if you want to start with Ichiro, Ichiro came at the most beautiful, perfect time to swoop down and show us, us in the United States, what our game might be missing. And this came right at the time when steroids was getting so out of hand and numbers were being obliterated. Numbers that were very important to the game of baseball were just getting obliterated. There was a question mark on Ichiro playing Major League Baseball. Can he do it? Or is he basically just hitting against a bunch of slap dicks over there in Japan that are nowhere near as good as we are over here? We're about to find out. American League Rookie of the Year. The guy could flat out hit. The guy could flat out throw. The guy could flat out catch, run. And he could hit homers when he felt like that was important. He kind of showed us small ball once again. So think back to when Babe Ruth came along. If you have any sort of desire to learn about baseball history or you have learned about history of baseball, Babe Ruth flipped everything on its head. 
Now, I believe when he hit 29 homers in the 19 teens, that was a major league record. And I think the next year he hit 54 or 59, something like that. But baseball had never seen what he was doing. And the game sort of shifted away from, say, Ty Cobb's form of the game, bunting people over, hit and runs, triples. And all of a sudden, people had a real desire for the long ball. Now, baseball used to be played in these big, vacuous open spaces, long, long dimensions. One park was 515 to center when it came out. Think about that, 515 to center. How many ballparks right now are 415 to center? Are there any? One, two, zero? So fences came in. That drastically changed the sport. For better, for worse, doesn't matter too much. But rules weren't changed to accommodate Babe Ruth. What the Yankees realized was, while Babe was an amazing pitcher, they wanted him in the lineup every day. And while you could pitch every third, fourth day and play in the field on the other days, he was so spectacular at the plate that they decided, let's scrap the pitcher, stick him in the outfield, and let this guy hit every day, not have to worry about the pitching side. But one thing that's probably pretty underrated about Babe Ruth, he had a cannon. So while you might think he was slow in the outfield, would you really want to run on Babe Ruth, the guy who I believe held a World Series scoreless innings pitch streak for several decades? Back to Ichiro. Spectacular. That Mariners team that year played a ton of small ball. They were fast. They hit a lot of homers too. But it kind of showed us in the States that there was this style of baseball that we might have been forgetting about when we were getting really swollen with home runs. Barry Bonds' home runs, I think his 70th homer was just a perfect example. He hit it good, he hit it hard, but all Enron field and right field was a complete joke. And this ball goes up into right field. It didn't really coincide at all with Barry Bonds' homers, say, in the 90s. And he could shit on the ball, let's not forget. But... I think we all got a little bit too used to the way Mark McGuire would hit a homer. It was like watching a high schooler take batting practice on a little league field. So we got reminded that there is a place for small ball and baseball. And no one did it better than Ichiro. And he kept playing all the way into the Hall of Fame. Next guy I think of is Shohei. What a beautiful time to come into the sport right around the time that they're trying to take hitting pitchers out of baseball, Shohei comes in and is the most Babe Ruth-like person since Babe Ruth. Could it be more obvious? He's showing you that there is a place for hitting pitchers in baseball. He's showing it to you. Now, I would have loved if general managers and presidents and managers of teams and hitting coaches started to realize I think a great way to get an advantage over the other teams is if our pitchers hit just a little more than them or if our pitchers were just a little bit better at bunting or our pitchers could just at least put the ball on the ground to the right side and move runners over. All those things are important. So think what Ichiro and Shohei did for the game. They showed us what we were lacking. Shohei and the babe. Now further back, When you hear people talk about the way the Negro Leagues was played, it was a ton of small ball. I'd heard that Rube Foster, one of the requisites on his team, if you were going to play for him, who was arguably the best pitcher at the time, was you had to be able to bunt. Jackie Robinson brought that other style, and the baseball world soaked it up and loved it. National League Rookie of the Year. Stealing bases, stealing home. Look at the numbers before Jackie Robinson. Not a ton of stolen bases. He reminded us that there's a lot of ways to play this game. And there's room to add things into the game and let it be the same old grand style of baseball. Everyone knows the rules. Everyone knows what you're allowed to do. The fewer rules that limit things in baseball, the better. You want to have freedom. Stealing a base when the pitcher might have the ball in his mitt and he decides to tie his shoe and you steal second base and the pitcher's like, I forgot he could do that. 
boy, the fans love that. When a game can self-regulate, which baseball proved it was great at for a hundred years, it's such a cleaner, more pure version of a beautifully invented sport opposed to, say, forcing it to be well-rounded with rule changes. And that just happened last year. Do you think it's a coincidence that for the first time ever, someone went 40-70? I never thought that I would see that happen. But it's got to make you wonder, is forcing more base running into baseball in the long game, the version 50 years from now, do we want it to be manufactured through rules? People can only pull the ball. You really don't want to see freedom on defense. You have to implement a rule that you can't play there defensively. That's one of the most favorite things I love about the sport of baseball, not hardball, baseball, is that you need to have a pitcher and a catcher and you could play other seven players wherever you think the defense would best go against the next batter. That's interesting. And we've joked for three years that eventually there's going to be circles where the defensive people can play, kind of like a video game. It's no accident that the name of the show is Mona Lisa Baseball. Just think of this really, really simply. The Mona Lisa painted by Da Vinci. There it is. It's classic. It's been able to bring that special word to itself. Classic. You know what she looks like. And you know, you know deep in your heart, there's nothing you can do to that painting to make it better. Somehow, it's just perfect as it is. Baseball had that going for it. Decades, decades, decades. And all of a sudden, there was a problem with the people running it. We got to change this for profits. The reason I have such a big problem with this is every time you change it and add a new rule, it's just not quite as classic and it's not as clean and it's not as perfect as it was and it's not as perfect as it would be if it could self-regulate itself. If we could have watched guys like Ichiro come into the game and revive this small ball technique, hitting pitchers like Shohei come into the game, instead of just letting them run free and watch him do his thing, as soon as he finally goes to the National League and we get a chance to do both, they make rules for him. It's not as clean. Next year, it might not seem as pure to you, but is it really that easy to tell when something is 1% or 2% less? It's not that easy to identify. But then you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, and you're scratching your head going, man, I used to be really excited for the baseball season, and I think it just kind of lost something. That's where we're living right now. We're right in there. From season one till now, the whole thing's been documented, and it's going to continue this way. Now, they didn't add any new rules. Well, a few little things were added, but nothing drastic, especially compared to last year. Baseball's back. Yeah, yeah, back. So we're stuck with the clock. We're stuck with the big bases. And we're stuck with all these uninteresting ballparks that have short dimensions so that ballplayers can have their agent go to new teams and say, my guy had 46 knocks last year, even though it's 360 to left center. Don't you think it's kind of something special that when DiMaggio was doing his thing, it was what, 415 to left, left center? Now, right down the line, it was shorter. But left center was about 415. Somewhere out in Yankee Stadium, it was 461. That's why there was inside the park homers. That's why there was all these triples. It's one of the reasons why batting averages were higher. Outfielders had to play deeper to protect themselves from the extra base. More balls dropped in. Look at the biggest, most cavernous ballparks now. They're nothing, nothing as close to as long as Yankee Stadium. Now, I'm not saying every ballpark has to be huge, but 
even Fenway was, what was it, 460, 480 to center for a little while? Before Ted Williams, there was no bullpen in front of right field, so it was that much further. I don't want to take anything away from Fenway. Fenway's gorgeous. But it was so disappointing to see the new Texas Dome Stadium. Let's just close the roof all the way through October in the World Series. Absolutely no reason to have these funny angles in the fence, but supposedly people like that because it's kind of like Camden Yards a little bit. It's not interesting. Forcing ourselves into a well-rounded game through rule changes. Add it up, man. 10 or 20 years, you're going to look at it and be like, man, I think we messed up. I'm just here to be canary in the coal mine. I don't think anyone out there can say they love baseball more than I do. I'm just here to protect the sport. I know I got the entire history of baseball behind me. I'm just letting you know how it is. Now, how did I do this spring training? Well, it's not over yet, but let me tell you. One day I got off of work, was grabbing some chicken feed, and I realized, oh, I'm a two-minute walk from my favorite pizza place. Grabbed myself a slice, called my name, added the Parmesan, went to sit down. What do you know? Baseball game in March on the telly. So I plopped myself in front of it. Let me tell you exactly how this went. Guy makes the first pitch. I can't seem to ignore this clock that's in the left of the screen. 16, 15, 14, 13. It's like, oh man, they move the clock right on the field. Pitch number two, 16, 15, 14. I literally picked up my pizza and left. So this season I've seen two pitches. So this might be one of the big changes that happens this season. Now, I was excited that there was no square in the middle of the strike zone to tell me if the cameras thought it was a ball or strike, not bothering to listen to the umpire. That was gone. That made me happy. But the ticking clock was right there, right there on the screen. And what do you know? When something's moving, your eye keeps getting drawn to it. Do you think that's the most important part of a, watching a baseball game is looking at the clock? That starts over every time, 16, 15, 14. Okay, Uh, drama, there's drama in that. Oh, it's down to four. It's down to three. They might add a ball. That's not drama in baseball. If you're a baseball fan, you know what real drama is. Looking at a clock to find drama, forcing it, ram feeding it in there. That's not drama. That's not going to help the long version of the sport. Other things this spring, I got to tell you, I'm so excited about baseball right now. Not Major League Baseball, the sport of baseball. People send me books. I'm a consistent shopper at the local library. I'm a consistent shopper at the used bookstore. Most used bookstores will have a wonderful selection of old baseball books because baseball was the national pastime. People have been writing about the sport forever. Grandma, grandpa die. Books get donated. You will find some old baseball books. You will find how people felt about the best game ever invented. A3 sent me this fantastic book, 59 and 84. What does those numbers mean? In 1884, old Haas Radborn, the pitcher, got 59 victories. Okay. Tim Lincecum won a Cy Young with 15 victories. Not saying he didn't deserve it. But aren't you a little interested how someone could get 59 victories? It's a great read. However, that one did not take the cake. Another friend of mine sent me a biography on Bo Jackson. Really, really, really fun to hear how Bo got started. Upbringing, high school, college, pros. Is anyone's story as good as Bo Jackson? He's very interesting. Now, the book that took the cake was a book written in 92 about Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean, my new hero. The braggadocio of Dizzy Dean was legendary. So he came up in, I believe, 1930. And Dizzy Dean was born so poor that he showed up to his first Major League Baseball tryout barefoot. He told everyone on the way up how great he was. And eventually he got into the Hall of Fame for 150 victories because he had a seven or eight year stretch that was so magnificent 
Most people said it was the best picture they ever saw. There's so much to like about Dizzy Dean, but one of the main things that sticks out, and this came from this book and it came from another book written by Carmichael called My Greatest Day in Baseball. And he introduced about 30 or 40 old timers about their greatest day in baseball. One of the great things that this book does is it records the game time of the greatest day that they were talking about. Not for every game, but it kind of has the statistics. It doesn't have all the statistics we're used to, like RBIs, but it has old school box scores because the book came out in the 40s. It comes with attendance and it comes with game times. Let me tell you something. The typical Major League Baseball nine-inning game back in the them good old days was an hour and 30 to two hours. So I wrote down this amazing quote from Leo DeRocher, and he was asked about Dizzy Dean. He was a Dizzy shortstop for a while on the Cardinals, part of the Gas House gang. So he quotes, you were on your toes. Your head was in the game. You stayed alert because he wasn't wild and didn't take all day. You show me a guy who takes his time on the mound, and I'll show you a goddamn loser. End quote. Leo DeRocher. What happened to baseball? What happened where a typical game is, what, three hours, three and a half hours? Why does it have to be that long? We've gone over all those factors on this show for three seasons, so I don't need to explain it now. There's always a temptation to re-explain everything that's ever been said on this show just to catch you up to date, but it can't work that way. Why was it taking so long that television and money and revenue won out to the point that clocks were inserted into the game? It doesn't have to be that way. I just saw a really great highlight of Jamie Quirk batting against Nolan Ryan, and Nolan's ready to go, and Jamie steps out, and he adjusts the batting glove and adjusts something on his elbow and touches his helmet a few times and then gets back right in the box. And the next thing Nolan does is throw right at his right hip because he was batting lefty. And Jamie avoids it and steps out of the box and kind of shakes his head with a smile like, yeah, that one's on me. So pitchers back in the day knew, let's keep this thing going. Bob Gibson was the same way. Another thing that I absolutely can't get enough of Dizzy Dean is he threw a lot of shutouts. And you know what? He also hit home runs. So here's a guy that can single-handedly win a game with a home run. And at one point, he had the strikeouts in one game record. So this guy just threw straight smoke. Another thing that was very impressive about him was he had 30 victories one year. And one of the reasons was if his team needed a victory, he'd go in and pitch. And he wouldn't just pitch necessarily three innings. He could pitch nine innings back-to-back games. He could have one day's rest or two days rest. And if it was a pennant crunch and they were close and they really needed a win, they'd send Dizzy in on two days rest, might throw another shutout. And mind you, these are against the top teams in the league. I couldn't get enough of Dizzy Dean because he seemed to exemplify something that's so missing right now. We have such a perfect example of what does it mean for a guy like Shohei Otani to hit home runs and be able to pitch shutouts, throw nine innings. You really want to go through the rest of history of baseball and not have that anymore? Now, I keep reminding you that the trickle-down is real. The trickle-down is so real. If we let this sport keep going as it's going, keep changing rules, not reinserting rules that can keep this sport self-regulating, it's going to all go to shit. This is what I've been warning you about. I saw a video of a Little League World Series. I call him the Little League World Series punk. I don't remember the kid's name, and I don't know what team he plays for. But I saw a one-minute highlight, and it was, you can't blame the kid. He's a 12-year-old. But it was a little disturbing. So I think they're in regionals. So this guy, Lefty, on a curve, just shits on a ball to right field. And he has a very, I got to say, it was a beautiful bat flip. For a 12-year-old, it was sort of bat flip that's not in your face, but it is a bat flip. And I got no problem with that. He does the Sammy Sosa stutter step in the second base, and then he taps his chest and points to the sky. Okay, we've all seen these things many times. Then the clip kind of goes to a point where he's just sitting on third base, but no, 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 sitting 
He's his butt is on third base. And he's doing the lotus position with thumb and middle finger. And he's grandstanding. Okay. First of all, his coach probably should teach him to not stand up the other team. I think that's important. But when you look at, say, the Rangers team and how they played the World Series, they don't give a rat's ass about grandstanding. I have no problem with grandstanding, just knowing that if you grandstand too much, it's not good for the game, and someone might stick one in your ear. Respect in the game can get overblown, sure. But if it gets completely obliterated and no one has respect for anything, the game will suffer. We're already seeing that, and you're going to continue seeing that down the road. The trickle-down is real. When I drove by my local Little League field yesterday, it was the first time I saw a crowd or any game uh, of this spring. Packed parking lot. Made me feel good about the health and the state of baseball. Actual baseball, not hardball. And I just drove by at 40 miles an hour, but I saw an umpire. I saw kids in the outfield with their hands on their knees. They were wearing their hats. And I saw an umpire and I thought, okay, it's still okay. Baseball is all right. But got to warn you, eventually when they put shot clocks in basketball, it didn't start right away in high school, but eventually shot clocks made their way into basketball for better or worse. But let's think about this. We're not that far away from having little league fields with pitch clocks. Does that sound good to you? Does that sound relaxing on a Saturday eating sunflower seeds, watching your son play, having to navigate a pitch clock. I'm asking you. I can't do this by myself. This takes the entire baseball community. I certainly don't like it. I'm just here to warn you that that's what's coming. Other things that were in the news, now that I've newly discovered sports radio, was court storming. So I'm sure you saw, if you're a sports fan, that there was an upset in basketball. The home fans stormed the court, and supposedly one of the players for the other team kind of got spun around, and there was an injury that came from court storming. Well, a lot of talking heads in the sports department jumped in and said, okay, didn't jump, demanded, this has to be the end of court storming. This is bad. People are getting hurt. Da-da-da-da-da. They didn't take the entire view of the thing. College basketball. These are students who play for a college. Who packs the courts of college basketball games? Yes, alumni. Lots of students. What could be more exciting than a big, humongous upset? At home, your team was supposed to lose. They win, and you storm the court. That's fun. Sports is supposed to be fun. There's a risk in that. Yes. If we take all risk out of life, is it as fun? You know it's not. If we could snap our fingers and there was no risk in anything, that would be nice. But having a little edge of danger does make things fun. Well, everyone wanted to demand that court stormy needs to end right now. So when Dan Patrick has his moment on the radio, his version was, yeah, I mean, obviously, just watch the sport. I mean, it needs to stop. We've had enough of this. But kind of taking a, what I would call a narrow view, not taking the entire scope of what is important to college sports. Don't think we want to make it less fun or it's going to lose something really, really valuable and important or all we're going to have left is gambling. So what Dan said was he compared it to Let's take Major League Baseball, for example. We got it right with the Nets. He goes, people were getting hurt in the stands. And he even got to the point where he said, isn't it crazy that we let it go for all these years that we just let balls get hit into the stands? We got that right. So now we can get this right too. And let's end court storming. I couldn't wait to talk about this on the show because aren't you forgetting about what it felt like as a kid to go to a ballpark and have the thought that I might catch a foul ball and you brought your mitt to the game and you stayed in tune with every single pitch because you thought this could be my chance to catch a ball at a big league baseball game off the bat of my favorite player. And now I could be holding it. 
that's really, really, really exciting. And that's, I wouldn't say quite eliminated from the sport, but we're going to get to the point where they start netting off the bleachers. And as a fan, you cannot catch a ball at a game. I've never caught a foul ball at a baseball game, and I've probably been to triple digits. I've never caught a legitimate home run. I've gotten them in batting practice, and I've had a ball thrown to me. I've touched balls, foul balls, but I never actually came home with one. If it's that rare and that hard to do, think of the thrill that a kid could get from that. So while people have been hurt at baseball games, we can't eliminate risk in life or things won't be worth doing anymore. I'll give you a great example. You're not supposed to go river rafting in a lightning storm. Well, I've done it, and it's exhilarating. There's a lot of risk involved, yes. Will I ever forget it? No. I've paddled a boat an entire season in the daytime on a river, and at night, the guides get together, and they paddle it under the moonlight. Is there risk involved? Yes. Will I ever forget it? Fuck no. Some of the best memories of my life. Sports has risk involved. What if we started telling football players, don't ever play because you could get hurt? What's that going to do to the sport of football? Now you got patsies out there instead of the best. You want to see the best. If anyone's out there that knows someone that got hurt at a baseball game from a foul ball, this is going to sound really callous. But unfortunately, you can't net up the ballpark or you're going to lose something really important to the fans. Let's move right along to uniforms. Yes, yes, the uniform fiasco. It happened. It's embarrassing. There's not a whole lot to say about it. Um, A good friend of mine who I've mentioned many times on the show just has really rock solid takes on sports. And he always said the more classic, the more old school you go, the better and never go away from it. In one of the seasons, I mentioned how far are we going to get from classic Yankee uniforms? And this is basically what I was talking about. We got riff raff uniforms. The furthest thing from classic trying to jack up Jersey sales. Are you really going to let 32 some odd billionaires change the sport that we all grew up with? We're letting that happen. Canary in the coal mine. We're letting that happen. It's well underway. You don't feel it yet? The Doug Gottlieb show. He was talking to a basketball guy. How college sports and now that athletes are getting paid It's changing things. It's changing the very fabric of college sports. And he said this great quote, and it wasn't about baseball, it was about basketball, but it pertains to this subject so perfectly. He asked the question, and he meant it, just like Chris Broussard asked, why can't baseball change? Doug Gottlieb says, is there a point where you have to protect the sport? Yes, Doug. Yes, there is. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm talking. There is a point. You can ruin it. When you start making changes for money, you can ruin things. It's actually the best way to do it is get money involved. Ask Dave Chappelle about that. Hey, Dave, do you regret turning down $50 and walking away from your own show that they were stealing from you? TV wanted a more concise game. They don't want a game to go 17 innings. They want to play that rerun of Friends for you. They don't need a game going six hours. And frankly, how often do you want to watch a baseball game that goes six hours? But let me tell you this. If there's a World Series game going 16, 17, 18 innings, and one of the teams has to win, you're on the edge of your seat. That's a guarantee. I thought up this idea. Would I be willing to go through all the BS that I've been seeing in the rule changes and just accept all of it. If I could get this one amendment, which was let's play the 1999 rules in the world series done. That's a deal I might make. It's fucking dirty, but I'd consider it just to save the world series. Because when this happens, 
when this goes down, you and I and all of us get robbed of baseball action on the field to decide a game and a clock does it instead, it's going to fucking hurt. And you're going to wonder why it was necessary. Don't you think that if a pitcher had to bat, the game might be a little different in terms of who gets beaned? Because here's the thing. Dizzy Dean, he threw brush pack pitches. Oh, he threw them. But you don't want to bean Dizzy because he throws straight smoke. Natural built-in protections. Every single spring that comes around, my wife and I, we've made this pact that we're going to watch the entirety of Ken Burns Baseball, the program that came out in, I believe, 94. We did it again this year. One thing I want to share with you was we had already agreed that every March we were going to get it. Well, I was at the library in early February, and I saw there it was waiting for me, and I mulled it over, and I thought, well, you know how much excitement my wife had when she saw the big box set? She might have been happier than me. Think how lucky I am. I think what's so special about this documentary is the interviews are so rich. And it's not all the people you'd expect. It's not just all the great players. It's people that love baseball. They talk about the sport. They talk about the game with so much reverence. You immediately know what you're missing right now. Nobody talks about baseball that way. You got on-field interviews now. How do you feel about the pitch clock? Well, I don't mind getting home a little earlier. How does that make you feel as a fan? Don't mind getting home a little earlier. Would you rather have that type of player or would you rather have the type of player whose uniform is filthy because he steals three bases, dives for a ball in the outfield, has grass stains, maybe even mix a little blood in there? Do you like those type of ball players? Listen for the passion in the voices about the sport. Does that exist anymore? I hope you're hearing it from me. Does it exist anymore? Is it in you anymore? Are you understanding that baseball has to play the long game? It's not about quick fixes. Another very, very fascinating thing that happened on the Doug Gottlieb show was, what do you think Rob Manfred's legacy will be? And I was like, oh, this is great. Because I've probably now heard shit, 50 hours of sports talk on FS1. And granted, this was in football season. Super Bowl was happening. NBA is in full swing. But I can't even tell you how far down the line baseball is. I mean, you could say it's third fiddle. They don't. I don't know that I've ever heard them talk anything, not a word about hockey. Golf might get mentioned every now and again. But baseball is really, 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 really down the line. They did talk about the uniforms and a couple free agent signings, and that's about it. Shohei obviously is in the news and he's worth talking about. What do you think Rob Manfred's legacy will be? And you could almost hear him scratching his chin. And he's like, he goes, eh, well, this is going to sound a little funny, but I think it really depends on what the TV deal is because baseball is in a little bit of murky water with TV deals. It's going to depend on that. But if that goes well, I think he said he's retiring at the end of 27 or 28 season. I think his legacy will be good. And I'm thinking, If he's right, I'm in deep shit. This is coming from the heart. You mark my words, though. Check in on baseball on the end of the 2028 season. Tell me how you're feeling about the sport. The other thing that just drives me nuts right now is it's not too much to ask, I don't think, to just play baseball. We have a little saying on this show. It's play real baseball. Mona Lisa baseball. Play real baseball. Just do it. Just play the sport that we all grew up with. Play baseball. And the thing is, there's become this thing where calling someone out and calling them a purist and a desire to just play the game the way it was intended to be played become the same thing. They're synonymous. Oh, you're just a purist because you, you don't want clocks. Now, A2 and I, we had long conversations about why the sport's slow, why they couldn't pick it up. And there's a million reasons behind that. But I think 
the sport would be a million times healthier if they could have self-regulated themselves and all looked at each other and been like, <laughs> okay, let's just speed it up. Let's speed it up a little. I believe the old manager of the White Sox, God, um, if I got this wrong, I'm sorry, but I believe at some point he was called the human rain delay where in between every pitch, he would step out of the box, readjust both batting gloves, readjust the helmet, uh, maybe check his eye black with a little mirror, with his little compact. If you're a pitcher, you got to throw at this guy. He's making the sport worse because now look what we have. We have clocks in baseball. And you, like my dad, like many people, you might like this version better right now because it's quicker. And there's a few things that works for you. One of the things he loves about it is if games start at 730, he can go to bed by 1030 and know if they won or lost. And that's a great thing for him. And he's been a fan his whole life. It's getting watered down. We're to the point where we don't even see the best two teams play in the World Series. It's becoming a tournament. You can feel it coming. They're going to shorten the season. They're going to make tournaments. You saw it happen in the NBA. Ooh, playoff tournament, pretty successful. Maybe we should think about that. Maybe we can insert a free playoff berth. Maybe a free World Series berth if you win the in-season tournament. Isn't that exciting? Got to keep the fans engaged. Got to keep those fans believing that their team might make it to the playoffs. Is it really better to have the weakest baseball teams be able to stay in the playoff hunt so that they could maybe get hot at the right time and win the World Series? The World Series should have the two best teams. It really ought to be the two best teams playing in the World Series. Let's think about important words here when we're talking about the uniforms. One word that comes to mind immediately when I think of real baseball is the word timeless. Even though it's moved around, you could compare Ty Cobb and Pete Rose in this really timeless way. Can we really ever compare anyone to Ricky Henderson? Because if someone ever breaks his record, and I don't think they will, but if they do, they're playing under new base stealing rules. Man, that's not as cool. That's not timeless. I got another timeless example for you. We've done our favorite baseball movies on this show. We've come up with our favorites. Let me tell you something right now. Make your own favorite movie list. Do it. Make your favorite all-time baseball movies right now and pause it. Just do it. And then think about this. Let me tell you this. This is going to hurt. You're going to tell me a clock wouldn't rewrite the entire fucking script? Every baseball movie that's your favorite just got obliterated now that we've inserted a clock. Let me flip your mind just a little bit more. Let me remind you of this now that we're speaking of movies. See how this one feels. Maybe this is on your list. Maybe it's not. A League of Their Own. It's a baseball movie. My wife and I actually did include this. This was her insertion was... After we finish the Ken Burns series, we watch A League of Their Own. Yeah, I'll make that deal. So we watched it this year. Watched it last year, too. Remember how that movie ends? A League of Their Own ends, or at least the last baseball scene, is a base runner plowing into the catcher. Buster, I'm sorry. It's the Buster Posey rule. It's not good for the game. It would be more exciting if you could plow the catcher. Check out a league of their own. See how that might change. The entire script rests on it. Yeah, yeah. It's a silly movie for sure. But let's not be under the illusion that these, oh, little tiny rules just kind of clean up a few imperfections and it's actually as healthy as it's ever been. It's not true. And the further we get from this point moving forward, the more it's going to continue to be true. I can't tell you how much healthier things were in March of 2021. They're not that way anymore. Canary in the coal mine. Work this through your noodle. And I'm going to remind you the same thing again and again and again. How are you feeling about baseball right now? How excited are you for the season? How excited are you to take your kids, to take your grandkids to a ball game and eat peanuts? I've been to a high school baseball game where they wouldn't let me eat shelled peanuts in the stands. How's that feel? 
And when I interviewed A3 about it, he said, well, I could do you one further. Uh, we have fake grass in our outfield, and uh, ball players are not allowed to chew sunflower seeds while playing baseball. How's that? Now, to the Texas Rangers guy, they got a lot of hype and had a tremendous World Series. I don't want to take a thing from him, but he naturally got on my nerves a little with his um, celebrating. You can't call it bat flipping. Mostly just grandstanding. You were hitting fly balls to left center. Those weren't shots. Let me tell you something. I'm 44 years old. I weigh 165 pounds, and I haven't swung a bat in 10 years. I think if I got a hold of one, I could hit one out where you did. That's not big time. And Texas, that's an ugly-ass stadium. How much money did you throw down the tubes for that ballpark? How much better was the ballpark at Arlington? Is it really falling apart? Anyway, welcome back. This is Season 4, Mona Lisa Baseball. We're back. Can't stop, won't stop. I'm out. You can ruin it. Does that feel okay? And once you understood the rules, you didn't have to question them. Can you do it? Just do it. And he kept playing all the way into the Hall of Fame. Classic. Add it up, man. 10 or 20 years, you're going to look at it and be like, man, I think we messed up.